with any kind of speaking, just like any kind of writing, just kind of that you're doing a science experiment, what, there are component parts. So you have to look at those pieces. I, mean, I, I, I say to kids, okay, so you've seen a speech before, you've seen somebody talk, you get it. Now let's look at the pieces and let's break it down. You know, you look at an introduction. What information are they giving you in that little itty bitty piece that leads to the, the main structure of the body that then gives you all this knowledge? And then how do they wrap it up? How do they tie those ends together at the, at the very end? And there, there have been uh, people who have said that the amount of work that a varsity debater, so junior, senior level debater, puts in for a topic like that is as much or more work than someone who is doing their PhD dissertation. That's so interesting. And these are high school kids. These are 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds who are doing that kind of research. And we wonder why they're becoming leaders? Because they get it. And they're able to switch off of an affirmative or a negative. Right, because they have to defend both sides. Every round, they switch sides. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are on site in the beautiful Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We are now going to be talking about speech and debate. We have Jennifer Bergen Gabor joining us on the show. Hi, Ms. Bergen. Hello. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I love it. I'm so excited. <laughs> Ms. Bergen was my debate teacher during high school, and she's made a profound influence on me and so many other students now. For those who don't know her background, she's been teaching for 27 years in South Dakota, currently at Roosevelt High School in Sioux Falls, teaching speech, debate, oral interp, and language arts. She was also the oral interp speech and debate coach. You can find her links in the bio below. Ms. Bergen, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Whew. It scares me some days. It really does. Um, you know, I just, coming from South Dakota and farm background and all of that and, and what all the, the trade implications that are going on right now and, you know, we've got more and more farmers that are filing bankruptcy and they're just not going to make it. And it's like, okay, what's, how are we going to fix this? Because once that happens, it's going to affect all of us here in town too. I mean, we don't, we live and die by all of us working together. We're a small state. We're, you know, in this region and we really have to hold together. And it, it really worry, worries me. And then you start talking about climate change and you talk about glaciers that are disappearing and all of those things. And there's just so much going on. And it's like, wow. And I have a little one, and what, what's going to be left for her when she gets to be my age? Um, so it concerns me. I, I think the political climate right now is, is very frightening. Um, it's just, it's so black and white, and, and we've lost that, that area of gray where people would get together and say, okay, we have to do some give and take for the best of everyone. And, and that's really frightening. So, I, you know, I don't know where that's going to take us. A lot of the spiritual leaders and spiritual teachings for the last thousands of years have talked about this connection to the divine or to source or to mm -hmm. nature. And the more that we have a, a, a whole connection to that, the less fragmented we are, the less we have issues that develop in our world. Right. And so the more that we then develop our own connection with the divine and then help the social fabric become more and more just beautiful and ethical and just maximize the bring, people bringing the gifts of all different sorts of gifts forward into our world. It seems like that would solve so many of the issues that we have, but it is, it does seem like, does it really, does it seem like it's that, like that fragmentation away from nature, away from source, away from those things? I don't know. I mean, I, I think about, you know, the, the whole big phrase out there now, and, and you see it on shirts, and you can see it everywhere, and it's like, if you can't be any, if you, you can only be one thing, be kind. And I think some people miss the boat on that. Mm. It's like, that's not just being kind to yourself, that's being kind to everyone. That's understanding, that's respecting, that's, that's, that's saying, you know what, we're different, but that's okay. And, you know, I talk about the political climate, and I think that 
so much now is things that I saw when I was a child. As far as, you know, the, the, the ethnic name calling and, and the racial slurs and, the, and all of that and, oh, we can't, you know, this. And, and the funny part is, you know, I, I remember my parents and my grandparents talking about how, oh, when the Germans came out, you know, those German neighbors, they were problems. And, it, you know, it doesn't matter what immigration group it is. It doesn't matter what, you know, if they're different than the rest of us, we're afraid of them. And, and what we should be doing is embracing them because they bring new and, and together it, it, the things that we can come up with and, and make this world a better place. You know, it's like, no, they're not invading us. They're enhancing us. It used to be that we would say, come, check in and, and bring what you have and, and do the best you can with it and, and we'll work together. We'll become neighbors. You know, and, and yeah, it just, it scares me. You mentioned the gray area, the nuance, the importance of multivariate conversations to figure out like what is our common sense making mechanism that we can best move forward with. And that very much so feels like it's under attack by radicalization, by cognitive ease, tribalism, echo chambers, algorithms, news feeds, all this type of stuff. And the also just the addiction to instantaneous gratification and pleasures rather than this like, okay, it's gonna take a while, but we have to like sit down and write out all the different variables and the complexity of it. Okay, okay. Now on the journey, who were you growing up? I probably never asked my teachers about who they were growing up and why they became interested in what they got interested. And now this is like the thing that I care most about is like, right. who, yeah. And so now finally, after so long, <laughs> tell us about How'd this you journey. Where you are today? Yeah. Um, I'm the middle of five who has, my, my sister's six years older than I am. And so when she moved out at 18 and never came back, I was an only, an only daughter with three brothers. And there was lots of change with that. Besides that, we at that same time moved from living in small town Minnesota back to South Dakota and, living on, and started living on a farm. So I was out working with my brothers, you know, side by side, hand in hand, doing farm work. Um, and my sister was nowhere to be found because she was moved on to college and everything else. Um, both of my parents are educators. My mom was a teacher. My dad was a principal. Um, we laughed about the fact that we weren't sure how the last two were going to graduate because dad wasn't going to sign their diploma. Yeah. You know, so that kind of came the, the running fun joke. Um, so we moved several times growing up uh, because of my, my parents' jobs and those kinds of things. And so kindergarten, first, second grade, I was in three different schools. Um, moved again then when I was out of sixth grade into seventh grade, moved again going into my sophomore year in high school. And I look at those and I go, yeah, it was kind of tough and yeah, it was whatever. Um, the other f funny thing is all of, the, all of the research, everything, even back then said middle school years are your toughest years. You know, that sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, that's the, the toughest. Try and keep your kids as stable and, and, and whatever every one of the five of us moved at some point during those time periods. And so we laugh about that. It's like, you guys were educators. You guys knew, and you moved <laughs> us anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? So, um, but the benefits of having to adapt to new situations mm. are so amazing. Yeah. You know, I even have conversations now with my students and I say, how many of you were born and raised and you've never been anywhere but right here? Ooh. What percentage would you say say that they have only been in one city? I would say it's at least half. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. You know, yeah. because we've become so globally diverse in, in Sioux Falls, mm -hmm. that's become less. It used to be probably three quarters. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. oh, well, we moved across town. Yeah. That's not what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, I switched from this elementary to this one, or I went to middle school. Mm -hmm. at, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, I'm talking about major cultural shifts. I like how you talk about this adaptation that you experienced mm -hmm. being like a beautiful lesson for you, a yeah. learning experience. Yeah. You're looking at it like, uh, like you're like kind of like learning from it and gaining experience mm -hmm. from it, and not like that it like something happened to you that like harmed you or hurt you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I was a little miffed after sixth grade because we stayed in one place for five years. I didn't want to move. Yeah. Right. Um, so that was a little tougher, but. Again, I grew from that. 
-hmm. there were there were some things that weren't so much fun but there were other things that I grew um, I still say going back to the town where our farm is that some people still look at me like I have three heads because oh my gosh we came back to small town South Dakota and we'd lived an hour from Minneapolis St. Paul mm -hmm. and we'd been there we saw the big city mm -hmm. and we knew there was a you know and, and they were just like um, well we went to Sioux Falls and that's like two hours away and some of them hadn't even been that far away from home. So, in, and this is in the early 70s, so you know, we weren't as mobile, we weren't doing as much mm -hmm. of that kind of stuff um, that we do now. Now nobody even questions it, you just go. So, you know, that became, that became that cultural, that was really the hardest cultural shift for me, is because people just kind of looked at us like, oh, you think you've seen the world and you know better, and, we, and so they would not necessarily treat us very nicely. Um, but I, I still learned from it. And, and I'm not saying that everybody was that way because they weren't. I, I still have some, some good friends from those years. But being able to walk into a situation, step back, take a picture of what's going on, size up the people in it, and then be able to step in and become part of it. Mm. Huge. 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 Yeah. You know, I, probably the best example, I was at... I, I was involved in 4-H and you know so a lot of the What's people I knew 4-H um, is a youth organization and so you know it's live it's farm kids and it's city kids and it's everybody but it's it's leadership and it's 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 working with you know all the different kinds of things anything from arts and crafts to gardening to sewing to you know showing livestock and all of that so my brothers and I were involved in that when we went when we were back and, and on the farm and I loved it I mean, just the, the people I met and all of that. Okay, so well, most of those people are in cowboy boots and you know Western jeans and and that kind of stuff. And I was at the state fair several years. It was probably one of the first couple of years I was teaching. So I mean, I'd been out of 4-H for about 10 years. And I'm sitting there with all of my 4-H -E, cowboy -E, Western -E, you know, wear your chick kickers kind of people. And we're just talking and, and all of that. And in walks this guy I knew from living in Aberdeen, whom I'd done karaoke with. Well, he's in a heavy metal rock band. So he's long hair and he's the leather and, he, and they're all just looking at him like, and he's walking right toward me. Mm. And these guys that I are friends of my friends, like so I don't even know them personally, are starting to get up off, the, off their seats. And it's like, I better intervene real quick here. But, when I, when I dealt with that situation, I said, guys, he's, he's cool, he's, you know, we know each other. Yeah. He gives me a hug and we, you know, we start talking and they just, <sighs> But just by appearance. But just by appearance, they were like, why are you here? Yeah. Damn. Um, this, and I thought about it other. after that, right? Yeah. And I thought about it after that and I went, man, I really am kind of a chameleon. Mm -hmm. And I can kind of weave into every, I mean, That's I can huge. put on the fancy Costumes, clothes and yeah. the whatever, and I can fit into the, the riches and I can fit into the yeah. everydays and I can, you know, I can just yeah. do that. And, and that comes from having moved around and that comes from having gotten to know people. Um, my mom always joked that we brought home strays and mostly me. Yeah. It's like, you're calling my friends strays. Okay. Uh, but I, but I would, I would, those are the people that I would say, Hey, you know what? You've got somebody here that'll, that'll stand up for you. That'll an be there eclectic for you. friend group. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I lot. find that even with my students, I watch out for those kids that that really look like they're struggling, yeah. that that don't have people going, "Hey, how's it going today?" Or you know, they don't have that friend group. They don't have. Yeah. They just kind of look like lost souls. Yeah. Um, so, and it, that's that's been something I've been doing since I was a little kid. I love that. Yeah, yeah. you know, those, okay. those are my people. Those are some of the greatest people around. I agree. Yeah, the ones, yeah. the the most non-conforming people are definitely some of my favorite. Yeah. 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 In fact, years ago, I'd look at some of my students and go, "You are such a freak," and they'd be like, "What?" I said, "Oh, no, no." In the good. That's a compliment. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're not somebody who just fits the norm and follows the rules, and you, you actually try to expand the world. Yeah. And you question it, and you and you try yeah. to go outside of that. Oh, okay. I said, "Yeah, you're a freak. It's okay." Yeah. yeah. I love, I love weird, freak, crazy. I love those words. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they actually are major catalysts for um, innovation and creativity mm -hmm. being expressed fully. Otherwise, it can get quelled yeah. by conformity. Yeah. Absolutely. Because yeah. if everybody's, then we're just machines. And we're just automats. <laughs> so this, yeah. is you in, this was you in high school. This was me growing the, up. Growing up. Okay. Yeah. And then how then in your later years were you like, I'm interested in teaching? 
so I went and got my bachelor's degree up at Concordia in Moorhead, Minnesota. Did speech communications, theater arts, knew I loved it, but I also got a degree in home economics, which now everybody calls facts, family and consumer sciences. And I wanted to work as a youth um, director in 4-H. That's where I wanted to go. I wanted to go back to what had given me all of that. I knew that no matter what I did, that's the age group I wanted to work with. I love working with teenagers and even some of the younger kids. Um, and I had done a couple summers in, in, the, in the extension office doing some of that stuff. So I knew that it was something I loved. Well, there was kind of a glut in the market at the time. So I get home. I'm farming with my dad because I've got one brother off with up with people traveling the world. I've got one that's a senior in high school and one that's off in college. So dad and I are tractor driving. He made the mistake one day of saying, hey, why don't you go in and get lunch ready? <laughs> I said, how about whoever's tractor um, runs out of gas first, goes and makes lunch? My dad made lunch all the time. He, he, it's like, whoa, where did this little sexist thing come from? And I just kind of laughed inside my head, knowing I had the bigger gas tank. Um, so <laughs> he caught the message real fast. My, <laughs> my dad were, and I were really tight, so that was kind of funny. Um, so I spent you know, time doing that and went, oh wow, my student loans are coming due. I don't have a job. You know, I'm living with mom and dad, I'm on the farm, yes, I'm working, but everything I'm doing is, you know, I'm right there. So I, I looked at what else do I want to do with my, with my degrees? And I ended up going and getting my, my master's in counseling mm. and focus on mental health and focus truly on alcohol and drug yeah. addictions. Yeah. Um, had a college roommate who was an alcoholic. Yeah. Wow. And not somebody who drank all through high school alcoholic. She didn't have anything to drink alcohol-wise until she went to college. But her biological system was such that the second she did, that was it, game over. Um, and she and I lived together our sophomore year, and I went up, you know, when she went to treatment and all that. So um, that, that just became a real passion for me. It's like, okay, so this is another way I can help people. So I got that degree, went and did, uh, some work at Macross and Boys Ranch, and also then worked at a um, human services agency and did a lot of alcohol and drug stuff. Um, created a group where I worked with teenagers who, you know, made bad choices and got arrested for whatever. So whether it was an underage or they ended up getting a DUI or you know whatever it was, then I created a group and, and I would have group meetings with those kids like once once a week. Mm. And I did most of the individual stuff. I also got to teach a DUI class mm. where. Most of those people said, but I only had one drink. But your blood alcohol was 0.2. Yeah, yeah. Double the legal limit. Yeah. And how big was the what glass? What did you drink, just How moonshine? big was the yeah. glass, right? <laughs> and um, uh, the funny part was when a friend of a friend ended up in my DUI class, and I was just like, okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so lots of um, youth um, for drug alcohol counseling as well as um, adults. Yeah. Um, and so, okay, so, so you kind of had this, um, uh, this early um, desire to help people with their, with their healing and with mm -hmm. their growth process yeah. and the yeah. reflowering. You know, bringing strays home. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. It never went away. <laughs> My mom wasn't wrong. Yeah, yeah. I'm not telling her that. <laughs> Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And so then that was going on for a couple years. Yep. Okay. And then it was like, okay, I get it. I hear the voices in my head. I'm supposed to be teaching. And I went back out my teaching degree. Mm. And that's where I've been. I took, I took a year, I, for, I taught for five years. And they decided that I should be the debate coach and teach facts classes. And I was like, nah, nah. I did it for one because they needed me. And I was like, no, 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 we're not doing this again. I had two separate classrooms, two different parts of an old building that was piecemealed together. So I was like trucking between the two. And he said, I can't do it to me and I can't do it to a sub. Mm -hmm. And so I resigned. And then I took a year off just to reevaluate if I was gonna stay in teaching. Mm. And then I did get back in. Into and just one of those instead of just both? Yeah, I, since then it's always been language, arts, speech, and debate. Theater. Yeah, not facts as well. No more. Yeah, no. that would be really hard. Yeah, well, th those are two very right. challenging. And, and there's, yeah. I mean, there's things that overlap. And you start talking about child development and understanding yeah. those kinds of things, and you know, and that was the joke. It was single survival and child development that I taught. And you know, I'd walk in the office and they go, 
but you, you're surviving as a single right now. I'm like, it's not the same thing as teaching it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're not funny anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Stop. Yeah. So, yeah, and I didn't mind teaching it, but I just knew it was going to be too much. Too much stress on me and too much stress on everything else. And I wasn't going to give 100% to everything. And so. this was then like 90. That would have been 97. Seven. Yep, fall of 97, spring of 97. Okay, and then that yep. was at um, Duel. Up in, nope, that was up in Aberdeen. Aberdeen yep. first, yeah. So Aberdeen, Aberdeen was first. Yep. And what year was the first student? Where were the first students? Like, I started teaching in the fall of 93. 92. Yep. 92. And, because okay. I was lamenting the fact that I was in school when Roosevelt opened. Mm, yeah. And it was like, oh my gosh, there's a debate opening. There's the, and it's uh, like, oh my gosh, everybody, all these positions are going to be filled. And I'm going to be a year behind them. And there aren't going to be any jobs. So I was a little nervous. Because I was then student teaching while everybody else had these jobs that I thought I was going to have a chance at. And there was a big shift in the debate community, which, you know, once that happens, that usually settles in for five, ten years. Um, okay. But, okay. So, so um, what were the age group in Aberdeen to start? for you? So I was teaching debate to sophomores because at that point Aberdeen Central had still the um, junior high so the freshmen were over in another building. They could come and be part of the team, cool. they could be in activities, but they were in a separate building. So we only had 10, 11, 12th graders in that building. So I had sophomores for debate, I, had, I was teaching junior English which was, you know, the research paper comp and American Lit. Mm-hmm. Somebody else was teaching speech who didn't have a degree in speech. Mm-hmm. And it was like, why? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and that, but I love teaching the, the Lit and stuff too. I mean, I just, again, you can start talking about the, the whole so connection to society high, and all of that. It's always been high schoolers? Always then? high schoolers. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. where was, so it was about four years then? F- at, so it's five, five in Aberdeen. Five in Aberdeen. Yep. And then where is Duel? Duel is in Duel. Clear Lake. Is in Clear Lake. Which is between, if you, if you take a triangle and make it between Watertown, Brookings, and Canby, Minnesota. Oh, okay. It's right there. Boom. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. And then there was another like four? I was there for six. Six years. And that's also where I went to high school. Oh, that's where you went to high school. Because back then it was still called Clear Lake High School. Cool. They had done some consolidating. Okay. So, and same thing, speech and debate and yep. language arts. And, yep. Okay. So. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, how did, how did you decide to move there? And then how did you decide to move to Roosevelt? How did you hop those two jumps? So my former coach and teacher, who was actually hired my senior year, was leaving to come down to Sioux Falls Lincoln. And she and I had been talking for a year or better about, hey, you know, is this something you want to do? You want to get back in? I was, I was still going out and judging. So I was still connected with the speech and debate community mm-hmm. while, I was, while I was taking that year off. So that was good. Um, and I just said, yeah, I might as well apply. And so I did, and they offered it to me, and I said, I can go back home. I had family living in the area. My mm-hmm. aunt and uncle lived right there, and a couple of cousins. And in fact, I ended up having their children as my students. I had former classmates' children as my yeah, students. Yeah. Um, I found out I was related to a whole lot more people in that town than I thought I was. <laughs> I was like, oh, your mom and my mom are cousins. Yeah, hi. Yeah. And your mom and my mom are cousins, and yeah. your my yeah. Your mom's my cousin, um, <laughs> you know, and that was my first sophomore class there. I think there were five of them out of 50 that were related to me, yeah, you know, yeah. and somebody would make some comment about, oh, my God, I said, oh, your life could be worse. You could be one of these people that's related to me. And they're like, yeah. oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, in fact, that year, the senior English class that I taught um, about month, two months in, the boys decided they were going to get brave enough to ask me how old I was. Mm. You know, because that's always the, how old are you? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I said, you know, we're, we're talking, and I said, eh, you know, you can guess. And they guessed some age that was so not even close. They were way low. And one of the girls was like, raising her hand, and I said, yes. She goes, didn't you graduate with my mom? Mm-hmm. I said, yeah, I did. Well, her mom was seven months pregnant when we got when we walked across the stage. Um, she now teaches down here in Sioux Falls, mm. has two little kids. In fact, her son was born the same day as my daughter. We talk about weird connections. Um, but her mom and I started 
reconnecting. We weren't friends in high school. We knew each other. We weren't unfriendly, but... Um, and she sent my parents a letter. Probably... My dad's been gone about six years now, so probably about t eight, ten years ago. Sent them a letter and said, I just want you to know how thankful I am that the two of you didn't let me quit. Because back in 1980-81, you didn't finish school if you, were, if you were pregnant. And my parents sat down with her and said, you have to do this. What can we do to help you? I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know they'd done that for her. Yeah. You know, so I mean, it's like, yep, that would be my parents. I don't know why I didn't think that, but that's what happened. Um, and, and she and I talked and she goes, I just, I just want you to know I sent your, your dad and mom this letter and, and I, I can't do anything but thank them. And then I thought, wait a minute, I'm not the only one that helps strays. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's a family thing. Family I mean, it is. We, big hearts. Yeah. Big hearts, definitely. Yeah. And then, so then the pull to Roosevelt then, how did that happen? <sighs> so when I was at Duel in Clear Lake, I was coaching Oral and Terp. I was coaching debate. And I was also directing three shows. Oh wait, plus I had a full-time job called teaching. I was to the point where my body was falling apart. Physically, I had a doctor say, what's going on? Something's got to give. That was it. It was just, it was too much because I also wasn't getting the supports I needed from my administration and, and all of that. And I just said, my health is more important as much as I don't want to leave here. I mean, I had, I had one year, I mean, Duels is a school of 200 in the high school. We had five kids at a national tournament one year. Wow. Going up against Watertown and Aberdeen Central and Millbank, which is a powerhouse at the time, and Huron, and all of those were all the ones we were going up against. I mean, it wasn't, in Brookings. I mean, so it wasn't like we were punking out and just getting lucky. We were, we were working our fannies off. Yeah. And I had an administrator who, because his football team wasn't being successful, he was mad. It's like, okay, if you're going to be jealous because these kids are having advantages, and every one of those five kids is doing unbelievable things right now. Mm. Unbelievable things. Great. I mean, they're all, over the, they're all over the country. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I know. And I, just, and I still keep in touch with all of them. And, I mean, yeah. That's what top tier speech and debate really do, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think they do that. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, one's process. an engineer, one is an administrator at a, a school down in the Twin Cities now. And that's not where she started, but, you know, hers was. Yeah. Um, one's doing HR for, you know, medical. And one is out in North Carolina still going to grad school and, and doing amazing things there. And just, yeah, one's out in the LA area mm -hmm. from. Duel, Clear Lake, From, South yeah, Dakota. That's a, those are all massive jumps, yeah. Yeah. And Duel's how, how big again in size? People want <laughs> The wise? town? Yeah. Um, maybe 2,000? Yeah, see, that's, that's a big deal to, right. to right. go out. Yeah, because mm -hmm. every single one of those people, when they say where they're from, the other people will be like, yeah, I've never heard of that place. Right, <laughs> every right. Time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so back to this yeah, transition to yeah. Roosevelt. So... I knew there was an opening at Roosevelt. Um, I also knew that I didn't know if I wanted to go to a school of that size and still be involved. I okay. was I was really burned out. This is a big I was really burned out. You were burned out and this is a big jump. So you're right. Yeah, you're so the so the school where you're you were teaching at was how many hundred kids? Two hundred in the high school. Two hundred in the high school and this is an order of magnitude bigger. Two thousand kids in right. the high school. So yeah, it's a big deal. Roosevelt High School at the time, if you counted staff, students, anybody that worked there, was about the same size as the town I came from. Yeah, that's crazy. And it, I mean, I said that to kids and they're like, what? I said, yeah, people actually live in those places. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they have smarts and they have good things going on and they have, I said, it's okay. You know, but that was culture shock for them to know that I had been, you know, so it's kind the of funny. school is the size of a city. Yeah, which is kind of what you get with these bigger um, yeah. public universities as well that well, are like 50,000 kid 2, universities. Well, now we're sitting at 2,500 students no, see, it's coming like, in yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? Um, yeah. So it, it is crazy. But there are so many things that are so much the same no matter where you go. Okay, so what were your, 
excitements, reservations as you're uh, moving here? Okay, move? so coming here, I had, within the year prior, finished my master's in administration. So I was really looking for administration jobs. Yeah. I was ready to move to that level, follow my dad's footsteps, yada, yeah. all of that. So Sioux Falls had an opening at the district level for a fine arts coordinator. Mm. And I went, hello, mm -hmm. this seems like a good, so I applied for that. So I didn't apply for the teaching job right away. Mm. In fact, it was July when I had my interview. They had already gone through a whole cycle of interviews and turned everybody down. Mm. Wow. So I came in and at the time Roosevelt was looking for someone and the Washington coach was taking a one year sabbatical. So I interviewed at both places on the same day. Mm. And I mean, I didn't even get 10 minutes away from the last interview and I got a call from the human resources and said, which one do you want? Yeah, that's great. So, I mean, I had a choice. Do I yeah. want to take the one year? Do I want to take, you know, the one that I know is going to be around for a while? Well, not knowing the culture of the Sioux Falls School District and openings that might be available in the following year, it's like, I don't want to be hung with just a one year position and I got to turn around and do all this all over again. Of course, yeah. So, and, young man who had been my assistant up in Duel was trying to get into the system too and had been turned down for some reason there was some black mark on his mm -hmm. information because they had they had said hey yeah we're really interested in hiring you and then IPC said yeah no you're not and they got their hands slapped and whatever um, so I was keeping in contact with him the whole time I said I, I said let me let me think about this and I'll get back to you called him and said okay here's the deal you, me, these two positions need filling. Mm. If I take the Roosevelt job, you can call the principal at Washington and you know that principal because he had connections through his, his kids and stuff from college and say, look, this is a one-year gig and it's, it's, it's even a part-time gig. I can take care of your program for a year. And so he went to bat then at IPC and said, look, this is the only guy that's out there. Yeah. So both of us came in the same year. We're both still here. Great. Oh, he's still there too. He's now teaching AP Econ and it, yeah. Wow, he made this leap in. Great. Right. Great. You yeah. know, um, had a PF team that made fourth in the nation. Had I mean, so That's coaching wise, he's deal. been very successful. Yeah. As well as teaching wise, he's been successful. That's a huge deal. You know, it's like you got to get this guy another chance. Yeah. You know, That's because he student is. taught while he was teaching full time. Yeah. Because they needed a teacher and they hired him on and. Yeah, yeah. in another town and I think that's where the problem came in because he really struggled he didn't have anybody mentoring him so when they got him you know when he got here he said here's what I need from you I need this mentoring I need these things to happen so give us an idea of what this has been like then let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and do it with the Roosevelt days and you can even uh, you know, sparse in a little bit of the earlier days as well along the way, but really these, you know, this last decade plus of, of taking what you've been learning in speech and debate, teaching that, oral inter teaching that, language arts, in dealing with all of the, like, unique learning styles of the students, dealing with the, the addition of technology into the classrooms, um, what has been, like, how do you, you know, take a big uh, field like speech or debate and how do you even like synthesize it into a prep like for <laughs> a uh, class right. so yeah walk us right. through this so with any kind of speaking just like any kind of writing just kind of that you're doing a science experiment what there are component parts so you have to look at those pieces I mean, I, I say to kids, okay, so you've seen a speech before, you've seen somebody talk, you get it. Now let's look at the pieces and let's break it down. You know, you look at an introduction. What information are they giving you in that little itty bitty piece that leads to the, the main structure of the body that then gives you all this knowledge? And then how do they wrap it up? How do they tie those ends together at the, at the very end? We take something like a great speech and then we begin breaking it down into its components. Mm -hmm. How did they make the intro? How did they make the body? How, in their conclusion, how did they wrap it all together to make it so that they were able to communicate something of great knowledge mm -hmm. and just pass it along to someone else? 
Yeah. Okay, and so then this is then the, the so then the process is then how do you get then students to then do things like go through that process themselves with topics they actually want to talk about, or sometimes you have to also give them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Guide how does this how does the process work? So years ago, I stole from somebody else because that's what good teachers do. Mm -hmm. We steal from each other, and and we readily admitted, hey, I stole that from you, yeah. um, and I and I really like it's it's three phases. If you break up a speech into tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them, then they're going to come away with the stuff that you want them to have. Okay, so kid, what is it you want to share? What do you want them to know? Find that information. Now let's get that organized. And now let's go back and, and get that introduction to set it up so that people are going to hear you. Because if you just start talking, and you haven't set them up, they're not sure what to listen for. So teaching them that they have to guide, just like they would if they're writing a paper, mm. is, is truly important. And then finish it up. You know, I tell them it's like a good burger. Mm. Yeah, you get the patty in there, but if you forget one of the buns, it's kind of messy. <laughs> you know, it's like, ooh. There's open face sandwiches and they're not bad, but you can't hold them in your hand. They're not concise. So, you know, I, I do all that kind of drawing on the board and that kind of stuff. And, of course, they find out I, I'm not artistic. And it's okay. It's okay. I readily admit it. Because uh, we all have our strengths. So, just being able to, to get them. In, and I try to use examples from their personal life. You know, when we start talking about how do you incorporate evidence. Mm -hmm. How many of you have said to someone, my mom just said to me, or my dad told me. And they're like, well, yeah. You just incorporated evidence with a source. Yes. So we do that every day. Yeah. I said, so, and I remind them that what we're doing is, is things we do every day. Tell we're just, stories. We're just yeah. giving it a name. Yeah. yeah. We're just labeling the parts. Yeah. You come home and you're, when there's someone at, your parent asks you, how was school? You're immediately giving a speech. You're doing a right. story right away. Yeah. Oh my gosh, this is the craziest day of my life. This and this and this happened. Yeah. So when this happened, but it... Yeah. Absolutely, we do it. Yeah, it's organized. It's planned out. Yeah, but we don't think about it. So now, when I make them think about it, they're like, "Wait, wait, wait, wait. think what? Oh, wait. stop thinking so hard. Mm -hmm. Pull those pieces together. Even to get them to frame an outline in outline format, Roman numerals and capital letters. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 this yeah. dumb look on their face, like, what are you talking about? And then I start showing them the, the whole web and clustering thing where you just put circles and you draw lines mm -hmm. to connect. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, yeah, I know how to do that. Yeah. And then I start drawing on there, the Roman numerals and capital letters. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Take what you know and then move it forward. Mm. That's true with anything you do in life. Mm -hmm. You know, as a little kid, you watch mom and dad drive the car and you might have a little something that you drive and sooner or later you're going to get behind the wheel and, it, you know, it, all of that, that memory, all of those things we've learned along the way, in education we call it prior knowledge. We mm -hmm. use that. Mm -hmm. So I try to find those common link things to help students. And then how does the student then get over some of the fear of delivering speeches? So I tell them there's always going to be butterflies. You put me in front of my peers, my butterflies are going. Mm -hmm. You put me in a situation like this and you and I are just talking, it's you and I just talking, mm -hmm. I'm okay. You put me in front of a classroom of students, not a big deal. That's, that's what I do every day. Mm -hmm. But if you put me in front of all those speech and debate coaches and I'm like, oh, I'm so, mm -hmm. you know, I still get the butterflies. Mm -hmm. It's okay as long as you know how to use them to your advantage. Mm -hmm. You take that energy mm. and you know maybe you got to make something really big so you can throw them out of there. Mm. So just talking to them about gestures and movement and body language and those kinds of things yeah. to let them know how do, you, how do you use it, how do you get over it. Um, and the key is if you're organized, if you've planned ahead, if you've prepared ahead, you are calmer because you know what you want to say. You're yeah. not going in going, what am I going to talk about? It, it, you know, yeah, yeah. you're just kind of weirding yourself out. Okay, I, 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 yeah, yeah. We, you know, we were talking yesterday and I was telling her all this stuff and, or I was telling my friend all this. Yeah, you know what you want to say. Now just do it. 
mnemonic techniques help a lot, the memory palaces, yeah. things like that. Yeah. yeah. And then I also tell them, you know, especially for those that just kind of like, <laughs> you know, the, the raceway speeches, uh, slow down and breathe. Because the second you take that slow cleansing breath, yes. and then you let it out slowly, you, you, any of us can feel our heart rate slow down. Yeah. That in turn slows down how fast you're gonna talk. Yeah. And if you need to do that in the middle of a speech, find a place that it works. Even if you're still talking, you can still do it. Oh, yeah. So just teaching them those little tricks that are, you know, that should hopefully become second nature to them. Oh, those are so good. Yeah. And I, and I tell them, at, you know, in the beginning, if I start talking too fast, you have to let me know. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know, you know, you, you couch a debate for how many years, plus I was a debater myself, plus my mom said I came out, the second I started talking, it was at the fastest rate she could, you know. Uh, so I've been talking fast since I was a little kid, evidently. Sometimes I need people to slow me down. One of my first years of teaching, I had a foreign exchange student in my class, and she dropped the class, and I was like, what happened? She goes, you just went so fast. I said, oh, all you had to do is tell me to slow down. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, you know, I saw her in the hallways and she and I talked all, all mm -hmm. the rest of the year and stuff. And she's like, I wish I'd have stayed and I wish I'd have known that. So I now make that very clear, clear. up front. Yeah. I mean, that was a learning experience for me too. I was, yeah. I was just a kid in, in, at the point too, so. How does the decision to, to give a students a topic versus let them freestyle their own topics come? So, to be honest, I don't just say, here's your topic. Mm -hmm. I will give them a pool yeah. of topics. So I have a speech that I've been doing for several years, and it's musicians who have made great change that has led to where we are today. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, the, it's musicians from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Mm -hmm. And the farther we get away from that, the closer we still are, because that music is right out there. You know, um, you, you go to any CSI show and that music is from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Yeah, some of those artists are still out there. I mean, how many concerts we've had here in town that have been those people. And it's amazing because, oh, that song's on Shrek or that song's on, you know, and they're, they're hearing it in movies and it's like, you didn't even realize this was this band. Mm -hmm. You didn't realize this was this soloist. And, and so it makes them think about even though that was 60, 70 years ago, some of it, it's still pertinent today. Mm -hmm. They still did things. I mean, you're not finding stuff from the 90s that's getting repeated now. But you are finding stuff from the 50s, 60s, 70s that, that keeps getting repeated. I mean, Dreamgirls was just done. Mamma Mia is all that music from then. I, I, keep going. I mean, it's just, it keeps coming back because it was good, solid music and to make them look at that. Okay, so, but what did these groups do or what did these individuals do that, who's the precursor to rap? Who's the precursor to, you know, who is the first one that did the big arena mm -hmm. concerts? Mm -hmm. Months from that era. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, as much as they go, once they start getting into it and listening to the music and realizing, oh my gosh, you know, there's always some of them that are like, oh, my parents listen to that and I listen to it all the time. It's the greatest stuff in the world. And mm -hmm. I want to do Elvis. Yeah, let's not. <laughs> Let's find some of the other ones. Elvis is on the list, but, you know. So, but it's fun. So there's, there's an embedded uh, educational or evolutionary, ethical, moral, spiritual lesson that's embedded in the topics that you give them um, in this one. And they kind of get to figure out what those lessons are themselves mm -hmm. as they f do mm -hmm. their research and give yeah. the speeches. But it's really cool to have it be about something like the evolution of consciousness and how much more aware or more towards light that we became from these great right. musical leaders. Right. Yeah. Right. And they're like, why isn't this group on there? Why isn't this group? You know, it's like, why isn't Queen on there? Well, Queen did some amazing things, but there were other people that were already doing it. Mm. You know, you talk about the whole rock opera and the, the, the storytelling and, and you're talking meatloaf. He was there first. Mm. So that's who's on the list. Let's break down the different styles of speech. So like oral sure. interpretation, extemporaneous speaking, original oratory, and informative, um, with, which includes visual aids. I remember doing extemporaneous mm -hmm. speaking, and that was a lot about finding 
evidence and then just going and giving a talk on right. a specific right. evidence-based topic. Yep. What are the differences between the other ones? I actually never did oral interp, but I thought it was quite interesting to take the different uh, beautiful um, narratives or pieces that had been written and be able to add your own interpretive style to right. the oratory right. yeah, delivery. Right. So extemp what you did, extemporaneous, is current events. You know, what's going on in the world or what's going on here, right here in the U.S.? You get a question and you have to answer it. But again, it's that introduction, body, conclusion. There it is. Um, Both domestic or international. Right, right. And you get to pick still? Yeah. You get to pick still? Yes, that's absolutely true. Okay. Yep. Um, and the, but the question is for how long is the question? A year or how long is it just a tournament? Is the question right? Because that question list, every tournament has a question list. Every question list comes. So yes, yes. the best you can do to prep for that is to pay attention to the news. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're watching the news, you're reading the news, you're organizing, and then and then you're filing some of those articles so you can go back to look at them. And then those same articles. And now they're doing electronically. You remember you, you was file oh my in gosh. a file. They get it all. Yeah. On Google Drive or whatever, right. they can just store that. Right. That's very interesting compared to what we had with the big yeah, tubs of stuff. Yep. And so it's cool um, that they can then take what they did for um, speech um, with current events and they can then apply that to their um, public forum or policy debates, Lincoln Douglas debates. So, right. Yeah, it can be. That crossover. Crossover. Yeah. Okay. And, and it teaches you a different kind of speaking style. Yeah. Which comes in handy sometimes too. A single versus a team, right. like with, yeah, public forum right. policy. Right. And a different yeah. way of using evidence. Yeah. You know? Yeah. One, you're using evidence to, to beat your point home. The other, you're using evidence as a support. Mm. So one mm. evidence drives it. The other one, the evidence is it. not driving it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So oral interpretation, um, one of the best ways to, to explain it to people is it's like reading a book to a little kid. Mm -hmm. And if you start doing Goldilocks and the Three Bears and you're like, and the three bears came in the house and they got scared. No little kid's going to listen to you. They're going to be screaming. They're going to be pounding. They're going to be doing whatever going, that's not right. Mm. But if you're like, and Goldilocks walked in and realized she was really hungry and, and, and she smelled the porridge and it smelled so good. So she tried it. And, and the first bowl she tried was too hot. And you're using your whole body and you're using your yeah. voice. and. Oh, this is just right, just you know. Right. And the bed, and the chair, and the and then the bears just come in right. and go. Oh, and the little bears cry because his stuff's all gone and broken, and you know, and mom and dad are going, "What the heck's going on in our house?" Yeah. That's gonna. It, it's bringing it to life, and it doesn't matter if it's a piece of poetry, if it's a children's book, if it's a narrative like you're talking about. Uh, any of those things, it can be a play, it can be in prose form, it can be serious, it can be humorous. Mm. There's there's so many choices. Bringing it to life yes. is the key. Yes. Yeah. Without changing the author's intent. Uh -huh. Because if you take a novel and uh -huh. you only have 10 minutes to present, I don't know too many novels that are going to fit in that 10, 10 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody talks that fast. Yeah. Not even debaters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, so you have, to, you have to cut what we call cutting. And you find that story within the story. And you tell that story. Mm-hmm. So maybe it's, you know, maybe it's a main character, maybe it's a minor character, but you like the story that's being told about it. And you just focus on that and you bring that out. Mm -hmm. So there's some choices that have to be made. And then physically you have to, you know, I'm, I, if you're going to be drinking out of a glass, I want to see you drink out of a glass and your thumb better not be here on your face and mm -hmm. you, know, you need to make it realistic. So it's all pantomimed as well. So that's, it's fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, besides individually, you can do it as a, a duo. You can have a partner. Mm -hmm. But one of the two, two rules that kind of throw it to make it not acting, you cannot physically touch. Oh. And you cannot have direct eye contact. Interesting, yeah. So you can look over each other's shoulder. So it looks like you're looking at each other, but you can't actually look. Yeah. Um, if something's sad, you can't have tears coming down. Well, you, you can bring them right to the edge, oh. but they, they're not supposed to drop because that's acting. Interesting. So it's it's that fine line. What? There's yeah, like you're a talking line about total body control. Acting? Oh, whoa. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, because you, 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 you can just... Because you don't get costumes. You can just gesticulate. Okay, yeah. yeah. No costumes right. and makeup. You can gesticulate, but you can't like start performing like really physically all over the stage. You can do some. Can't cartwheel and shit. 
Yeah. Um, there have been people who <laughs> have done some of that or dropped to their knees or... Oh, that's okay. Right. But interesting. Or they'll make a hug, but now they're almost touching each other. Okay. Interesting. Okay, yeah. so, there, so you can't go into acting. That's, that's cool. It's right There's to fine. The, yeah, it's just right to the edge. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So... Okay, so duo, can you go trio or quartet? Can you so go? So you can do duo, or in South Dakota we have a thing called Reader's Theater, which is three to six people. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so those are fun too. Okay. And those they can actually write their own if they want to. Ah. So I've worked with students. Um, one time we took Dr. Seuss, and to think you saw it on Mulberry Street, and then we took other Dr. Seuss books, and it was right around the time of the O.J. Simpson trials. I mean, so that's how long ago it's been. And we even threw in something about gloves, with, with mm -hmm. the whole glove not fitting. And I mean, so we brought in pop culture as well, but we, all these little pieces, you know, the foot book was in there and the, I mean, we just, everybody picked, brought their favorite one and we worked as a team to put a piece together. We sat on my living room floor and went, keep it, don't keep it, to, you know, and, and had a blast. Now, would I have that group on my living room floor now? 27 years later, no. We're gonna stay at school, mm. where there's cameras in the hallway, where there's, and, and that's something that's changed that, that is really too bad. Whoa, you can't take well, the practice outside of the... What happens if something happens in my home? And who's to say it happened or it didn't happen? <sighs> we live in a whole different world than we did 27 years ago. <sighs> you know, those parents were like, oh, you're at her house, great. Tell me when you're ready to go home, or, or at least let me know when you're on your way home. No big deal. Everybody brought snacks, made sodas. Yeah. yeah. We worked for three hours. And that was after we'd had practice at school. Yeah, yeah. So it's 9, 10 o'clock. They're still at my house. Wow, how fast things yeah. Yeah, change to a more big brother yep. Yeah, yep. style of, of existence. Yeah, because we've become wow. so litigious. It's like, oh, you're going to put a lawsuit on me. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, people have lost their jobs because somebody said, well, something happened. Well, nothing happened, but you were mad at that person, so you said it, and there it is. That doesn't go away. Okay, we'll talk more about these differences but, in a little bit. Yeah. Okay, original oratory and informative. Too. Original oratory and informative are both student-written. Mm. So they do the research, they pick the topic, they do it. Original oratory is persuasive. Mm-hmm. And so quite often it becomes a problem solution, but it can be a, here's what's going on in the world, where are we gonna go from here, kind of concept too. Um, so that one's kind of fun because, I mean, soup to nuts, everything is possible. Same thing with informative, you can pick a topic. And they do that topic all year at the tournament. Yes, once That's they the write same. it, they can, yeah. always, they can always tweak it yeah. and, and do all of that, but they stay with that same speech because they memorize it. And how long would you say then you're given for, um, and oral interp is as Oral interp is a 10 minute maximum. Oratory and informative are 10 minute maximums. Okay. Extemporaneous is five to seven minutes. Minutes. Yeah. And then does oral interp also get uh, like a single performance throughout the year that I've put together? Usually. Usually. They'll stay with it. And some of them will have two different pieces they're working on. Okay, yeah. And right. So maybe they've got a humorous one and a serious one, or they're in a duo oh, and, a, and a solo one. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, or they're doing okay. an oral interpiece piece and they're doing original oratory as well because they want to write their own. So they can cross, they can cross all of that. So at, at most with extemporaneous speaking, they're getting a couple like hours to prepare for their... 30 minutes. So, qu so here's the question Here's the question, list. you have 30 minutes and you're speaking. Yeah. Which is why I say you have to know what's going on in the world. In the world. You have to be yeah. on top of the news. Yeah. To and be able the, to do it well. And then because, yeah, you're pulling the card from the evidence about this article mm -hmm. said this from the source, yeah, about what's happening. Right. So, okay, 30 minutes on that one. Okay. So that was, I think, original oratory. Okay. And then yep. let's do informative. And then informative too. is fairly new. It just started in the last four-ish years. Um, and it can be, again, any topic. Like I said, we had a student from another school who was walking around with a toilet seat because he was talking about bathrooms and, and how they've changed and how mm. all that kind of stuff. Um, one young lady was carrying around a little, a little mini coffin because she was talking about funeral homes and, and working in them and doing those kinds of things. Anything's fair game, any topic, and they get to have those handheld visual aids. 
So I mean, they can have posters. To the, to the judges, they just have them up there with them, up so they're using them. them. I can right. bring like props of visuals. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's yep. interesting. Um, so people were using a lot of 3D kinds of things, and and mm -hmm. you know, some used posters and some used actual items. Yeah. So that that's so that's nice because now you've got two very different writing styles in in a persuasive original oratory or in that informative style. You know, mm -hmm. one you're just telling about something and giving people yeah. that information, the other one you're trying to pull them to your side of the uh, of the um, issue mm -hmm. and, and get them thinking the way you want them to think. And are, for all of those speech <clears throat> subcategories, are they all being judged by multiple judges and then the multiple judges are picking well, like a ranked order of like uh, ascribing which one of the performers that I give the high score to versus the second, third, fourth, fifth, and then right. those scores are congregated. So, so what will happen in a, in, a, in a regular round, in a tournament round, is there will be one judge in the room, and then usually not more than seven competitors. Uh, and then that judge has to listen to all of them, write comments to them, give them feedback, things that went well, things they can work on, and then they have to rank them one, two, three, four, five, 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 five. Okay, so quite often we just stop at five. Mm -hmm. um, some tournaments now are stopping at six. Some are saying, nah, just rank them all, it's okay. <clears throat> because then those One scores. One being the highest. Right. And then they'll either have two or three preliminary rounds. So they'll get two or three different judges that mm -hmm. will hear them. Mm -hmm. And then those scores get tabulated, and then the top, you know, five, six, seven will go into a final round. And in the final round, there's three judges in the back of the room. Okay, yep. So yep. it's not just based on one one person's view of it. Yeah, I'm actually a little bit. Um, I would love to see more adults, especially like in their twenties. Like I would have loved to continue like mm -hmm. to do doing extemporaneous speaking, like in San Francisco and stuff like right. that. Like I would have right. loved to see that. So happen. I know the one organization that exists. Is Toastmasters. Yeah. And they do have competition. Yeah, they do. Yeah. So that's that's one option. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, yeah, you're right. That's that's pretty it's pretty good. That's pretty solid. I wish it was more popular, is the thing. Like mm -hmm. I wish all of these were available to all ages with judges that were being like paid and that there were people right. that were excited about about this and that like that this would help with that whole thing we were talking about with nuance and gray area and yeah. 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 Because you look beyond yourself. Yeah. Whether it's oral interp, whether it's extemp, whether it's original auditory or inform, you have to look beyond yourself. What is it that I'm trying to bring to the rest of the people here? Yeah. What do I want them to hear? Hear, yeah. And yeah. it can't just be my own thoughts. I have to support it. Yeah. Okay, let's do debate. So <laughs> let's do debate. Let's do debate. So okay, let's start with policy debate. Okay. So policy debate is wanting to make a change in the system that's going on now. Okay? Just like our, you know, Congress will make a policy change. Mm -hmm. They'll make new law, they'll make whatever. That's what policy debate does. So look at the area of climate change. Okay, so what are some ways we can better handle climate change? That's on the affirmative. They want to make the change. The negative says, it's good right now. Let's just back off. You don't need to make this change. Status quo, let's keep going where we're at. And they'll argue that back and forth. Mm -hmm. You know, what are advantages? What are disadvantages? You know, why, why is this a good idea? Why is this a bad idea? And support it with evidence. Mm -hmm. And multiple sources for it. Because if you just get one source, it's like, yes, so one guy said that, or one, you mm -hmm. know, one woman, or one organization. Show me there's other people out there that believe the same thing. Back it up. And then show me with scientific evidence. I don't just want some schmuck that's read a book and decided to tell the whole world what he thinks. Mm -hmm. I want to have more than that. I want to know that there have been some studies and some research and, and those kinds of things. Yeah. So policy debate really gets in depth. And through the years, it's been things like um, consumer product safety. Uh, Every four years, they'll do an international topic. Mm -hmm. So it's you know it's China, it's Russia, it's it's Latin America, it's whatever, and it might be trade, or it might be uh, human rights issues, or it might be you know any of those kinds of things. We've done education, we've done military, we've done. I mean, and, and the topics kind of start repeating because there are some really big picture items huge ones, that yeah. are that are important. Yes. 
Um, we can. So, we so can that's also, kind of cool. I like I, I got I got a little uh, a little list of some for for people. Yeah, I don't that, even know what this year's topic is. <laughs> this year's is the United States federal government should substantially reduce direct commercial sales and or foreign military sales of arms from the United States. And then the year prior, the United States federal government should substantially reduce its restrictions on legal immigration to the United States. Prior to that, increase its funding and or regulation of primary and or secondary education in the United States. And then prior to that was this international, increase its economic and or diplomatic engagement with the People's Republic of China, substantially curtailing its domestic surveillance, all these incredibly thought provoking right. topics. Right. right, Yeah. And there, there have been uh, people who have said that the amount of work that a varsity debater, so junior, senior level, debater puts in for a topic like that is as much or more work than someone who is doing their PhD dissertation. That's so interesting. And these are high school kids. These are 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds yeah. who are doing that kind of research. And we wonder why they're becoming leaders because they get it. And they're able to switch off of an affirmative or a negative. Right, because they have to defend both sides. Every round they switch sides. So, you, so, so they start on affirmative, let's say, in the first round, and then they would switch to the right, negative in the right. second. They'd have to debate against a different different team. Team. Yep. Yeah. And they're persuading three judges. Same thing with preliminary rounds start. with speech. You get one judge. If and you get into a finals, if you get into out rounds or like quarters and that kind of stuff, then you'll get three judges. And same thing in public forum and Lincoln Douglas. Right. One right. to three. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right. So. And, and so the negative is basically trying to do their best to make it so that the keep the status quo, don't yep. listen to what the affirmative is saying, these are the reasons why you shouldn't listen to an affirmative is like, we need to transition to nuclear fusion for energy as soon as possible. Here is the vast amount of data and sources that yep. are saying Here's this. the problems they're going to create, the world's going to blow up, the mm -hmm. nuke war, whatever. Versus the high efficiencies of it, this is why we should do it. Yeah, right. yeah, okay. Right. right. Yeah. See, this is why I'm really happy you brought up how it's, um, it's actually like as much research goes into this as um, even a PhD dissertation. I mean, can you believe the more uh, young people and even adults later in their lives that have to do that much work to come up with a pro or con um, argument on these topics, be able to switch? Like that's what's mm -hmm. gonna get more nuance, more gray area, more thinking instead of just a simple cognitive ease right. binary statement about something. Right. Yeah. And just the skills, the research skills, the thought skills, because you also have to ask the other team questions. So you need to come up with yeah. questions on the fly. You need to get those answers on the fly. And they need to be concise. They need to be focused. They need to be, because you're on a time limit. Yeah. You've got three minutes to ask as many questions as you want to ask. Yeah. yeah. You've got eight minutes to present your speech. Yeah. You got five minutes to wrap up in your rebuttal. They, they're not huge amounts of time. It's not like you're getting an hour. That's right. Yeah, you have to you have to do a compression algorithm on the key points. Right. And then yeah, you also have to you have to f do um, flow. You have to flow really yep. well. So you better take good notes. You you see so yeah. So when you when you do um, in a sense, it's parsing for the key points that they are saying, writing those down with like abbreviations so that you don't have to. Like I still use, you know, BC for because or BW for between right. or whatever. Which is the W slash or with. W slash for with, w yeah, this type yeah. of stuff. With, without yeah. W slash yeah. O. So yeah. I use arrows. Arrows, <laughs> yeah, tons of arrows. Yeah, like toward. Alt, toward, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. So but, so you're you're really, in a sense, you're, um, yeah, you're getting really good at like parsing for key points, which is actually extremely relatable to everything else that you do, like when you're listening to other people talk, your friends, your families, coworkers, um, your um, romantic partners, all this stuff, like, do you know how to listen for a key point and then ask a question about that right. key point, which is literally a key to life, mm -hmm. is like that right there. Right. And you get excellent at that through debate. Right. Yeah, because you're doing it, you know, during practices, and you're competing every weekend, and you're, you know, you're constantly just improving on yourself. Yeah. Or you'll be in the Owen oh, life column on the, you know, everybody else is going to kick your fanny at the tournament. And yeah. Why did I win? Well, you didn't work very hard this week, did you? Yeah. Yeah. What's the, um, 
Let's talk about the um, let's talk about evidence as well. You mentioned this a little bit for extent, but I just want to say like this is really interesting that what you would do is you would take. Um, some whatever you have as evidence and it used to be interesting because we would do things like try and like use like a Wikipedia as evidence but no you have to actually look at what we're Wikipedia citing we'll right. cite the citing look at the, the primary source the primary source right because right. and, and, Wikipedia is just another encyclopedia encyclopedia right. and so okay so then what you do is you would take something and you would actually like instead of you know have a big 10 page like you know that that'd be a lot to try and you have to synthesize that into like a paragraph and that would be like your little like abstract right. about it right. and then you would th it was called a tag a site and a body right. and like that would be the body and the tag would maybe be a sentence that's even synthesizing that and then the right. site is where did it come from the citation and hopefully the tag is reflective of the body yeah it has to be. some yeah. people do what we could refer to as power tagging it's like yeah that didn't really say what you think it said nice try though uh, yeah. <laughs> read that line again it, no, that's not what it's. That's funny because that is actually really applicable to the mainstream media right now, where these tags, these headlines are just clickbaity, and the bodies don't even. And people don't go any deeper. They don't go any deeper. They just show yeah. 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 I was like, what are we doing, people? Debate is so important. It's like something that like it should be yes. a requirement. Yeah. So speech or debate is only a semester. It's only a semester requirement. Required. But we're one of the few states in the nation that still require it. What do you mean? Like literally, they just like, dropped. Like I think there's ten or less states that still require it. Ten or less states require just a semester in high school. So was there at one point when all fifty states were required? I don't know if all fifty were. But a lot but more were. Yeah. And why did well they, over half? Why are like the humanities and language arts taking the toll? The, the, well, yeah. okay. When 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 Common Core came in. Uh, there was talk here in South Dakota about, well, they've got the speech component already built in, so we really don't need it anymore. We should just get rid of it. This is the State Department of Ed was talking this. Well, we got wind of it and went, back the train up, because you're wrong. And even the English teachers were like, we don't have, we don't have time to deal with the curriculum we have right now. No. Because it's, it's the repetitiveness. You know, they, they do a speech. We talk about what they did, what went right, what went wrong. Now, let's find another topic and let's try again. Yeah. And we have 18 weeks to do that. Whereas, and you know this, even with writing, you got six weeks to write a research paper of whatever sort in a class. Okay, I'm also not just teaching them how to stand up in front of people and get the words out of their mouth and teaching them how to outline. I'm teaching them how to use evidence and how to incorporate that in and all of those things. And now they can take those skills into that six weeks in that English class and they don't have to take as much time to teach it there because these kids already know it. And you want to get rid of this because, yeah, we don't think it's a good idea. So many of us wrote into the state because they had a, a time where we could make comments and that's well, that's been several years ago now when Common Core was first coming out, and we haven't heard anything since. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there's <laughs> it's, it, it's great that even the English teachers were like, whoa, whoa, yeah. whoa, we can't add that, and plus right. we don't, that's a, that's a critical life requirement or skill that we don't teach in our English classes. That, so it's actually something that, I mean, if I was to, again, if I was to, you know, be someone that could um, make a, a request would be treat debate and speech like it's a serious life skill, um, which it is literally sp like speaking, persuasion, uh, synthesizing ev evidence, note taking, um, persuade, all these types of things are just, they're so critical. And um, nuance, gray area, being able to switch between pro and con, I mean, those are such critical things. So. Um, instead of a semester, let's make it a year. And instead of a year, let's make it a lifelong thing where you're like frequently going through these processes. That's in a sense, that's, that's what, besides featuring all the different leaders in their fields like we do on the show, you know, I'm also synthesizing what these hundreds of people are teaching us on the show into some sort of a cool, relatable presentations along the way in these, and then eventually multimedia content, all different types of things. And so it's, it's so applicable to life and it's just like, can we make it more popular when we're adults too to be doing these types of things? Like, 
could you pick up a, a complex project like healthcare and could you then go and look at you know dozens of books and peer-reviewed papers and all these types of things about um, about the way that we do healthcare and the future of healthcare and how to most optimally meet those requirements for people and and paint some sort of a strategic next steps on on how to best do that like if how much more of a well-rounded person would you be if you did that so it's just like it's like common sense but it's it in, in many ways, like what was going on in the Agora days and the Greek days, or it's just more of this like Socratic dialogue that was occurring, and now it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> so interestingly, and this is a great example, I, there, there's not a college that I'm aware of that doesn't require at least a semester of speech. And the vocational schools, the tech schools have all, you know, the junior colleges, whatever they're calling them now, have all gone to the same thing. You have to at least take a semester. We had a young lady several years ago that came back on one of her breaks and was at an Ivy League school out on the East Coast and said, you would not believe my classmates and some of my friends who went to Ivy League prep schools who were panicking during speech class because they didn't know what to do. Yeah. And she said, little old me from South Dakota was like, I got this. Mm -hmm. Speech was easy. Yeah. And they're like, what did you, did? she's like, I had to take in high school. Yeah. They're like, what? Speech was offered in high school. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? So unless you, unless in those schools, unless you're on a speech and debate team, you don't get it. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, she was feeling pretty yeah. <laughs> full of herself, which was good. I was like, good for you. You, you deserve to feel that way about it because you took those skills that, that you got from here. And I, and I tell my students that now. This is what I heard from someone who went to an Ivy League school. I swear, Ms. Bergen, I swear that looking back, how you can connect dots more easily about your um, life outcomes and your life trajectory, I swear speech and debate is just like one of the biggest pillars in the bedrock of altering mm -hmm. my life trajectory mm -hmm. in a more positive direction. Even the days even you and I butted heads. Even when we butted heads. Because that was you learning too. It was. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. You know, and I knew that going into teaching it. <laughs> yeah. Coaching it. It's like, I'm going to butt heads with some of these kids. Yes. And, and I will tell you, I've had kids who are a lot smarter than me. Who had no common sense. So I tried to fill in that for them and said, you're on the right track. Here's the skills you need. You take that brain of yours and just run with it. You know? I don't care if you're smarter than me. I always know I should work with people who are smarter than me. They'll make me look good. Right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I love the way that something like a speech and debate, like butterflies effect, butterfly effects out, like your thousands of students that you've had the chance mm -hmm. to to teach have now went on. You, gave, you were giving so many other examples earlier. It's just mm -hmm. like teaching is so rich in that sense of like passing along really yeah. solid like students being able to come back and just be like, thank you so much. Well, like the letter to my parents, it was 20 some years later. Yeah, 20 years later. Yeah. It's a, it's a long-term delayed gratification. Don't even expect the letter, but when they come, it's like, whoa. Yeah. 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 The cool thing about content like this is that also we actually literally have people commenting on the videos and saying things like, wow, that was so interesting or that altered this thing for me and my right. talents. And it's cool because you get like a faster feedback cycle, mm -hmm. um, but there could be something cool like a piece of content that lives on for a really long time and then right. impacts people down the line. Let's talk about um, the other styles as well. So there's Lincoln Douglas debate and public right. forum debate. So uh, Lincoln Douglas is the only one that has a one on one. Right, Lincoln Douglas is one on one and it is more philosophical. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's asking, ought we do this? You know, when in conflict, which one is the higher value? Mm. So you get the philosophers, you get value level debates, those kinds of things. Um, and that just started in the early 80s. So that's, in a lot of ways, still in its infancy. Um, we'll call that the toddler mm. because public forum has only been around for about 10, 15-ish years. So it's an infant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a baby. Yeah. Um, and it has changed because it was 
Ted Turner debates because he gave a bunch of money and sponsored it. And then it, I mean, so it's had a couple of different names. Mm -hmm. And even now they're talking about changing the, the layout of it and, and changing how much time for, for the different portions of it. And those what kinds do of they things. want to do? To, what, what are the changes they want to make? Um, well, what's happening? So, so public forum, topic wise, first of all, yes. is something that's, that's in the news now. So, I mean, open up a newspaper, or listen to a news show, whatever, and if it's something that's a big thing, that's something that could be in there. We have um, um, more. I had those as yeah. well. I mean, one, one time it was the NBA dress code. And do they have a right to tell these people who are making millions of dollars how to dress? Well, the question is, do you work for me or don't you work for me? Oh, yeah. I mean, I can't go to work in my swimsuit and throw a pair of shorts on. Yeah, yeah. There are things that I know professionally I should be doing. So the question was, can you have your pants sagging and you know all the metal on you and, and looking like you're a gangbanger and go out and, and do an, an interview when you're representing our team? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's those kinds of things. That's interesting. Yeah. That one's a that really, one was really kind of fun. That's a really interesting yeah. one, yeah. Um, in just uh, last just last year was the United States federal government should impose price controls on the pharmaceutical industry um, and then the, a couple months prior to that was the United States should accede to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea without reservations. The United States should abolish the capital gains tax. Spain should grant Catalonia its independence. The um, United States ought to replace electoral college with a direct national popular vote. The United States federal government should adopt a carbon tax. Testing is benefit standardized testing is beneficial to the K through 12 education right. system in the United right. States. So these right. are kind of the topics. Right. And it's usually what's going on then. And those change every month. Yeah. Every month. Every month. So you're not getting as season. deep as you are with policy debate. Which is one topic for the year. For the entire year, yeah. right? And some of those kids go to camp in the summer and they start researching in June yeah. for tournaments who don't start until November. Yeah. So they're working. Um, Lincoln Douglas changes every two months. Mm -hmm. So in South Dakota, they'll do two different topics. Mm -hmm. And public forum then has four? Four or five, yeah. Four or five on. topics. Yep. yep. Yeah. So. <sighs> And then, and yeah, public forum ahead. is supposed to focus toward lay judges. So okay. anybody walking on the street, we should be able to pull them in, and they should be able to judge it. And is that usually the judge? That they, is, a yeah. Lay. That is the goal. So you can literally get like a letter to Mom your house. Mom and pop can come. Mom and pop can come. As yeah. I tell them, if we're short a judge, we're going to go grab the custodian. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, he lives in society too, and these yeah. are societal topics. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, should be geared more towards the lay, whereas maybe policy is geared more towards Congress style of like P of thought well, of school. More trained judges. More trained judges. Yeah. Right. Right. They understand the style and they understand the the different argument types and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, there's a difference. Uh, some differences in the um, style for Lincoln Douglas and public forum versus <laughs> policy, but. Um, Highly recommend those that um, either are in the um, current educational system to please get involved in speech or debate, or even those that are parents and listening, please get the children involved in speech or debate. Um, or if you are adults, find a way to get involved with speech and debate, please. Um, get your schools to support it. And get schools to support it, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's also talk about the relationship that you've had with source or with God or with the divine, what has been your relationship with that through your years? I, I grew up going to church and, and being a part of that and, and it, it still is very much part of my life. Um, I, I believe I don't have control in this world. Mm. And, I, and I look at my personal life and you know, people are like, wow, you're, you're 56 years old and you have a four year old. And, I, and I've gotten to the point now where I look at them and say, you know what, God called and I answered. Mm -hmm. it, I didn't think I was gonna have a child of my own. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, life had, my body had said no and, it, and everything else. Um, in fact, my husband and I will have our 10th anniversary coming up here in November. So we haven't been together that long. And we were already in our mid 40s when we met. Um, so, Divine intervention, absolutely, absolutely. 
Um, my daughter is an amazing human being, and her birth mom was not in a position to, to take care of her in the way that she really wanted to, and so she made a very selfless decision. And when we met her, she said, I, I'm really happy having met you, and you're the ones I want to raise her. And we had five weeks to prepare to have a baby in her house. And I got things from my mother like, you're too old. And I finally said to her, here's the deal. I didn't make this phone call. Mm. This phone call came to me. And I said, and besides that, guarantee me a 27-year-old is going to be alive in 10 years. Guarantee me any of us are. Because there are no guarantees. Mm -hmm. You know, accidents happen and health issues happen, and we all deal with that, and, and it happens when it happens. And I mean, my mom's 83 years old, and she's doing pretty darn good. You know, my, my dad's mom was almost 98 years old when she passed. Mm -hmm. My mom's dad was 92. I think I'm going to be around a little while. I got, I got good stuff going on both sides. You know, so if I take care of myself, my daughter's got that chance. Um, so, I mean, to me, that's, that's huge. And I guess my connection, my strongest connection with church has been music. Mm. I love the old hymns. I, you know, in fact, I sing them to my daughter, and she's like, what's that song? What's that song, Mom? Sing it again. You know, and it's, it's really brought me back, because I, all the new hymnals, all of that, and they, they've taken out some of those really songs that are really deeply meaningful to me. Um, in fact, I have my grandmother's old hymn book, and it's just the, it's just the words. It's not even the, because it's the little ones they would carry to church, and somebody would play, and they just knew the words were there, and they went. Um, and I, so I flip through pages some nights, and, and I'll just start singing to her. And it's gotten to the point where, where she sings with me, and, you know, she wants to do that. Um, so, yeah, that's just been, and thankfully I met a man that, that believes as strongly as I do that, you know, this is. I mean, I joke about my modern day family. I got my husband on the internet and my daughter from a phone call. Yeah, 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 yeah. It happens, you know? It happens the way it's supposed to happen. I didn't have any power in that. I just said, hey, we'll check this out and see what happens, and that's where my life happened. You know, so, yeah, I, I truly believe that. And I, and, I, and I hope, as I'm walking through my life as an educator, and as, as just a human being and a mom, that that is being reflected to other people, that that's who I am. That I believe that giving back and, and loving people for who they are and where they are and helping them to grow and become who they are, they're going to be, that's because I've got the power behind me, not because I'm doing it. So, yeah. Yeah. And I struggle because I have a niece right now that just, she's not believing. And she's really having a hard time. Mm. And in fact, last spring, a classmate, friend of hers, in the sixth grade, committed suicide. Damn. And I found out Damn. that she was also contemplating. So that's been really hard because before I got married and before I, I lived, you know, very close to them and she was my girl. And I feel like I've let her down. So that was a hard one for me right now. So I, you know, I make comments like she was watching my daughter the other day. And I said, you know what? We don't have all the answers. And yeah. we don't know. Yeah. I said, but don't close your mind to it. Yeah. And I'm not going to push it on her. It's I'm just going to say that to her. It's an adventure. Yeah. It's like, don't yeah. close your mind to the possibility that that's true. Yeah. And I used my daughter as an example to her. I said, she wouldn't be here if it wasn't. Yeah. You know, there's only so much you can do. So... But, but my students are like that too. I just, you gotta love them where they are. Yeah, and help them love themselves. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I, I probably say it every day in my classroom. I love all of you. Yeah. I do not always like you, but I love all of you. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. I said, you just did something really dumb. I don't like that. Yeah. Well, I love you. You're uh, a good guy. Yeah, you're a yeah, good gal. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're a human being that I can handle being around. Mm -hmm. Would you stop doing the dumb stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Because I know we got we have students who don't hear that at home. Yeah, the I love you. Yeah, absolutely yeah. not. Yeah, and mm -hmm. that 
they have this beautiful gift that they can bring to the world. It's about you know finding what is that gift, yeah. remembering what is that gift. Otherwise, then those meaningless thoughts mm -hmm. can yeah. take over. Yeah. Does it feel like the that this is all a big creative expression of source or God of creation? What I do? Does it, does everything feel like that? Does it feel like we're all bringing our gifts forth like paint strokes on the canvas? Yes and no. Because I think the people that don't have that spirituality, that don't have that belief, I think if you, if you don't, if that's not part of you, I don't, I don't think that comes through. Mm. You know, those people who are just like, yep, life is life. And sh sh and rocks, whatever. Um, the people who truly have that, I think that it, it comes out. Um, and that, and that, you know, obviously that worries me for those people that don't. Um, do I think they still have possibility? Absolutely. You know, I would never give up on anyone. Uh, they, there's just so much. I mean, anything any one of us does is, is a stroke, but which side's it coming from? You know, is it coming from the side of, of blessing or is it coming from the side of, of evil and, yeah. and force? Because yeah. those forces both live in the world. Yeah, purposely and we, so. And, we've, and, yeah. We've, and we fight them every day. They make creation gorgeous. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Would you say that the, what would you say is the meaning of life? Maximizing creativity, consciousness, maximizing experience. Wow. That's it. That's, yeah. Um, I guess being your best self and, and putting forth the best you can to make the whole a better is, is really the thing. Because if, if I can put my, my best self forward and that then benefits you and benefits you, it's that butterfly effect. It really is. Anytime I can give of myself, I'm, I'm getting back as much as I'm giving, if not more. And as long as I keep believing that, you know, I mean, I tell my students, I'm going to learn from you as much as you're going to learn from me. I don't sit in that classroom thinking I'm the only one that knows anything. Because I'm not. I have learned from anyone who's walked into my life. And, and that to me is, is the key. It's, it's being open to that. Open to giving and open to receiving. Because the second you close yourself off either direction, somebody's losing out, whether it's you or the, or the person with you. So, yeah. Does it feel like the that spirit comes to meet the body for school? I, I'm not sure what you're asking me. As in, does it feel like spirit meets the body, or does it feel like consciousness biologically emerges from? the evolution and then does it feel like this process is kind of like that spirit or consciousness coming for school on earth to bring certain gifts forth have lessons learning experiences this type of thing yeah i think anytime you open yourself up again to that giving to others whether it's my knowledge that i give out when i'm teaching or um, I sit with a student who's struggling on a personal level or, you know, whatever. I had a young lady who came to me a few years ago and she said, you know, I, I don't know what's going on. I'm, I'm just about six months clean and I'm about to get my six-month medallion. And my dad and my brother, I'm, I'm questioning if they're still clean. And that's what I'm living with, and that's what I'm dealing with, and, and it, it's a month till school's out. And she's gonna graduate. And I, and I looked her straight in the eye and I said, what do you need from me? I said, you're 18 years old. You are gonna make this decision. I'm not gonna call in and say, hey, look, she's in a tough place. If you tell me you need a place to stay, I will help you find that place. And, and, and she prefaced the whole conversation with, you're one of the few people in this building I feel like I can talk to. So creating those relationships 
is as much of what I do every day as it is telling them how to give a speech. Yes. Um, yes. And, and I've, I've had those similar kind of conversations throughout my 27 years. I, I have. So then the, the, the idea would be then, there's the theory then would be like, would of your potentially, would of your spirits have literally voiced that prior to incarnating into these bodies and literally have decided that that, that discussion was going to have been had and that you were going to be really important roles in each other's lives and you didn't even know about it until that point in time. Oh yeah, I, I believe that there's so much that's predisposed mm -hmm. that we don't know it's coming. I mean, we're doing our thing and we're making the best choices and the best decisions and doing all of that, but there's still stuff that's gonna happen that it's like, oh, yeah, that was supposed to happen. Yeah. My daughter was supposed to happen. I had a conversation yes, with that yes. young lady was supposed to happen. I mean, there's so many things in my life that I go, didn't see that coming. But there it was, and it was important, and it was valuable. What would you, what would you say about us being in a simulation? What do you mean? Like somebody's pulling all the and we're really puppets kind of thing. There's a lot of or, ways to, to, to put it yeah. on. Maybe that on it. Um, An alien species is we, testing out things on us? We've all, that we've <laughs> potentially already went to the point of um, evolution to the most complex thing and then we basically embedded another source sure. within. Um, and so here we are just evolving as, a, you know, so do I believe I, I lived another life? Um, maybe it would be Are more we... like, do you believe that what is occurring right now is reality? What is reality? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> there are days when I question reality, don't we all? <laughs> yeah. 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 I do believe it's reality. I, I just in, in the nature of some things that happen, it's like, yeah, nobody could have planned that. No, nobody could have thought of that. Um, whether it's something somebody says, whether it's something somebody does, right? I mean, this whole conversation, it's very organic. Yeah. I don't think anybody planned out, you were gonna ask what I was gonna say, what, yeah, it, yeah. It, no. Yeah. I think it's just happening in the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? My daughter, but... Um, just that whole evolution of life, you know, that the cradle to the grave. Yeah. And then that process just continues on and on and on. Yes. And my daughter's got my grandmother's name. Why? Because I just wanted to honor my grandmother. Yeah. You know, I mean, those kinds of things. And I think that that keeps those people alive in our memories and in our, you know, in, in our world. Yeah, it does. Because um, she was a huge part of my life. And I, and I think we, we just do that. I mean, you look at, at so many people and that, you know, they, a lot of those older names are coming back now. Yeah. And it, it's very interesting um, because it's like, yep, that's a family name. Yep, yeah. I wanna keep that one going. Yep, I wanna, you know. With me, it was not necessarily, oh, it's a family name. It was, uh, it can't be a name that's on, I've ever been on a student list. Because I don't want my child to have to live up to or live down something that someone who was a student of mine ever did. Hmm. I want her to have her own future and her own, you know. And then look to those things. Because my husband and I laughed about that when we were coming up with names. Because the birth mom let us name her. And uh, he starts rattling off all these names and he was teaching at the time. And I said... Will you please stop? I said, where are you getting these names? I was just thinking through my class list. I said, you have to stop. I've been, I've been teaching for 20 some years and this has got, no, <laughs> not gonna happen. And he's like, what? He's only been teaching three, four years. I said, I have heard all these names. I can tell you who all these people are. In fact, I can tell you multiple people who were these, you know, cause they've had the same name. Um, so that was part of that whole process of, of coming up with a name and, and a collective to say, who is this child to us? Yeah. Yeah. So, Whoa. I mean, it, it was kind of fun. Multiple people with the same name. I yeah. can tell those five have had that yeah. name. Versus um, coming up with something so unique or also coming up with something that's in the familial lineage. Yeah. 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 Stuff like that. I mean, that. I wasn't going with Jennifer. 
Yeah. By the time I was a senior in high school, that was the most popular female baby name. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There aren't very many of them my age. But boy, there's a whole lot of them that are younger. Yeah. And I got tired of hearing it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah. I just wanted something that was Damn. special. Unique. Get as yeah. unique of a name as possible. Yeah. And that's that doesn't mean one. you just spelled it funny. Dear Lord, you don't need to put funny. six Fs in a name. You don't need to put 12 Zs. You don't need to... Uh, no. No. Unique, <laughs> unique identity. And your name doesn't have to be north or south or east or west or moon or... <laughs> Mm -hmm. Those are a little bizarre, in my opinion. You know, Moon Zappa. You're too old and you're too young to know that one. <laughs> moon, <laughs> Frank Zappa. Uh, yeah, Frank moon Zappa's Zappa. kids were Moon and, and Dweezil or something. Moon and Dweezil Zappa. <laughs> yep, those are unique. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So. This has been so much fun. I know. Thank you, Miss Burton. Thanks Absolutely. For Thanks for having me. I've had a huge blast. <laughs> Thank was, you. Yes. Thank it you. was good. It was a lot of fun. Yes. Yeah. Crazy stuff I hadn't talked about for a while. Yeah. Good. It's all your good, fault. good. Yeah. Good, <laughs> good to hear that. And and also just so nice to unpack your journey, and also nice to unpack just the importance of speech and debate. And I really hope that for all those that tuned in, we greatly appreciate you tuning in. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about speech and debate, about all this nuance that we unpacked about those, those two fields, as well as just bringing more nuance to our conversations around our world and the importance of funding the speech and debate that are happening within schools and organizations and popularizing that more for even adults and kids in our world. Let's get that happening, everyone. Check out Jennifer's links in the bio below and also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders, the organizations around your communities that you believe in around the world. Support them and help them grow. Support Simulation, our links are below. You can contribute to us on Patreon, Cryptocurrency, PayPal, or Design Cool Merch and Get Paid. All those options are below. And also go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.